Good morning, everybody, and welcome to another Florida Friendly Landscaping Program on this uh, December 1st, this beautiful winter morning here in Florida. And we are going to start December outright with a program entitled, What Could Go Wrong? What Could Go Wrong? Common Landscape Problems and What Causes Them? And I'm gonna let you know right now, we're gonna cover a lot of things a little bit <laughs> today. Later on, um, as the weeks progress, we're gonna have some follow-up programs to this. So don't get too worried if um, specifics didn't get covered. In upcoming weeks, um, mostly in January, um, Dr. Bill Lester is gonna join me and get into specifics. I do not cover vegetables or edibles at all in this program. He's gonna have a program concentrating just on vegetable gardens and other edible product, um, other ed edible crops. And we're also, he's gonna get more into um, some diagnostic classes as well. This class, we're just gonna cover basics and what could go wrong in several basic areas of your landscape. I am Lily Browning. I do work for Hernando County Utilities here in Hernando County, Florida. This is my email, Lily B, L-I-L-L-Y B at hernandocounty.us. If you would like a PDF version of this uh, program, when I'm finished, just go ahead and email me here, Lily B, remember two L's in the middle, and ask for a PDF copy of this. This is being recorded. It'll be available on Facebook this afternoon, if not before. And I also send it um, to my counterpart, uh, John, at Hernando County Government on Broadcasting. And he will uh, edit it a little bit. He adds an intro and an outro. And if we make any major mistakes or anything, he'll cut it out for me. And it will show up on Hernando County Government YouTube probably in a day or so, depending on what else John has um, scheduled. So um, if you know someone who just would like to watch these classes, but doesn't do Facebook, give them the YouTube links, go to Hernando County Government YouTube, look under my playlist, Florida Friendly Landscaping. There's more than 60 classes there right now. So it's a big rabbit hole, you can get lost down. <coughs> Excuse me. My program is called Florida Friendly Landscaping. And here are the nine principles of Florida Friendly Landscaping. Everything I teach is going to tie one way or another back to one or more of these principles. Today, we're going to cover right plant, right place. We're going to cover watering efficiently, fertilizing appropriately, mulching, and managing yard pests responsibly. We're going to cover a whole bunch of those today. So let's get started with the lawn. Probably because that is gonna be one of your most problematic areas of your landscape. Now, let me start out by saying my lawn is not a problem, but it's also because I am not a lawn particular person. I have green, mowable, grassy stuff out there. Otherwise known as a diverse lawn area, or even a freedom lawn full of weeds. Sure, yeah, there's lots of weeds. Weeds um, like um, turkey tangle fog fruit or frog fruit, which attracts a myriad of butterflies. I like to have a lawn that has a lot of life in it. Now I know some of you live in deeded, um, deed restricted communities that have very, very high standards in a lawn. And therefore you have to have a certain standard of lawn and truthfully that's where I see the most struggles is with people attempting to have this perfect sterile <laughs> um, you know emerald green lawn but here are some of the lawn problems that exist this picture here is of a St. Augustine lawn a Floritam lawn Floritam is a variety of St. Augustine some of the diseases that you can run across um, in lawns would be rust, 
It's actually a disease called rust because it looks like rust. Um, large patch disease, that can be found in your zoysia grass lawns for those of you in the villages who have a lot of zoysia grass. You can have various leaf spot diseases. There's gray leaf spot, which has been found around here in Hernando County. But this one I skipped is because I want to concentrate on it, circle back to it, take all root rot. Chances are very high that if you have a lawn problem with a Floritan lawn in central Florida, let alone Hernando County, chances are really high it has take all root rot. Your lawn company may be telling you it's chinch bugs, it's chinch bugs, it's chinch bugs. At the Hernando County Extension Office, they have master gardeners and they have Dr. Bill Lester who can um, take lawn samples for you and diagnose them for free. Sometimes they'll have to send them to the lab at the University of Florida. Therefore, it could cost you some money. I'm not sure, somewhere in the $40 range. <coughs> but for free, they are so good at testing for this take all root rot. And they take a sprig of grass. What you're gonna do is bring them a piece that is eight by eight, 12 by 12, somewhere in, don't bring them anything from here because you know they can't perform autopsies. <laughs> They'll just tell you it's dead. That's all we can tell you. If you take somewhere from this area where you still have some good grass and you know where the line is happening, where the bad stuff is happening, they can look at the roots. These roots are supposed to be white like these. There's not supposed to be any black roots. And they can put them under a microscope. They can see the fungal bodies that cause this take all root rot and diagnose it for you. Take all root rot is not curable, but it is manageable. It's in the soil. The conditions are, exist here in Florida for it to grow in our soil. So even if you replaced all the soil, the conditions still exist for it to grow there. What you do is learn how to manage it properly and the extension office can be a good guide. They can recommend certain fungicides, but remember fungicides are preventative, not curative. So a fungicide isn't gonna do anything to bring this spot here back to life. What it could do is save the grass further out um, from contacting this disease. Now, if your whole lawn looks like this, and you replace it all with the exact same plant, lower tan lawns, you are pretty much guaranteed to get that disease again. If you replace it with Bahia, Bahia tends to, it'll get take all root rot, but not really suffer from it. So those are just, I'm just putting ideas in your mind so where you can get started. This here, it might not be take all root rot. And, you know, to, to visually diagnose something is nearly impossible. You have to uh, talk about what's going on in your lawn, your own cultural practices, and also do a diagnostic test to figure out, is this take all root rot? Is it another disease? Is it an insect problem? Is it a watering problem? There's so many things to try and work out um, with your lawns. Speaking of insects, I'm going to throw these insects out there because they can be lawn pests. But let me start out by saying the county extension office and the master gardeners, when they have brought a um, sample of grass in the past four years or so, they're not finding any insects. They're not finding chinch bugs which is we're in the habit, the lawn companies, all of us, our neighbors, everyone are in the habit of saying, if there's a problem with St. Augustine grass, it must be chinch bugs. Because 10 years ago it was, 20 years ago it was, 30 years ago it was a big problem. Unfortunately, obviously we have uh, applied 
we as in we in general, all, you know, the community has applied so many pesticides. We're not finding these insects and you're, you're gonna say, well, is that a bad thing? It is a bad thing because we're not finding the beneficial insects either. Really upset the balance of nature. <clears throat> but that doesn't mean you don't have any. So we'll discuss, you know, what could be out there. This white grub, um, what you, you know, can be found in any of the turf species, turns into a beetle, um, can eat some of your, um, you know, will eat the turf itself. Fall army worms, they really cause any real damage. Um, and it's best just to let the natural predators that you already have in your yard take care of them. Again, you can't do that by killing them. And unfortunately, when you broadcast spray and insecticide on your lawn, it does not know the difference between the good guys and the bad guys. And what usually happens is the pests will always generate, regenerate faster. You killed off the weak ones. You've left the strong ones to breed and regenerate. So, you know, you really upset things and made things worse for yourself. So chinch bugs, as again, I mentioned, they were, they used to be a problem. They're down here. Here's the different stages of what they look like. Um, and maybe you'll find a few, but then again, there's a threshold of uh, chinch bugs. When, when chinch bugs were really a problem, they would say, you know, if you find more than 20 per square foot or something like that, you should treat. Um, if you find a few, that's not a big uh, deal. Also, there are beneficial insects. If you, la the last time we met, we did a class on beneficial insects. If you didn't get to see it, go back to my Facebook page or to Hernando County Government YouTube. You'll learn there, among many other things, about big-eyed bugs that hang out with chinch bugs and look like chinch bugs, but they're predators of chinch bugs. So over-treating can, in, you know, sometimes these insects are a problem. More times, over-treating for them is the real problem. Here's some more insects that may, you know, have been known to occur in lawns. Um, you have mole crickets, ugly, ugly dude, isn't he? Yeah, yeah. Um, he can be found in Bahia grass and Bermuda grass. Can be a problem, more of a problem for um, athletic fields, you know, things like that where there's a lot of Bahia or Bermuda. Um, I've never really seen these guys like eat up an entire front lawn, but you know, they can be there. Hunting bill bug. If you have zoysia grass, that is your bug du jour. That's the one you get to have. Um, and I threw fire ants in here because they're not necessarily, uh, they're, they're a pest in your lawn. They're not necessarily a lawn pest. They are a pest that resides in your lawn, they, you know, they're a pest to you um, when they bite you. And, um, you know, they can, they don't generally show up in a very thick lush lawn. You know, they're gonna show up in more of the sandy areas. The drier, as soon as it starts getting dry and stops raining, I have them pop up. Um, I always say my neighbor and I, we play fire ant uh, chess. You know, I treat them, send them over his yard. He treats them, sends them over to my yard. You know, then, you know, checkmate, it's your move. Um, but there are no real controls to permanently um, eliminate these fire ants. But bait treatments around the mounds and individual mount treatments with baits does help control them. That is the best way. Treating, um, spot treating where you have the ant problems. Another thing that really helps combat them is allowing our native ants, you know, the ones who sh should be out there, the black ants, um, even carpenter ants are native ants, but I know you're nervous having them around your house, um, and taking up that niche. 
So, you know, if more of our native ants move in, there's not as much room for these fire ants. Um, the other things you may have heard on the internet, such as uh, putting one mound on top of the other, no, that doesn't do anything except get you bit up. Um, you know, any of the other grits, they don't chew. So therefore this is not going to blow up, you know, in their bellies. Um, now, uh, citrus drench, something like that. That has been known um, if you follow those directions like on a, on a citrus based oil and do it very early in the morning. You might have to do repeat treatments. I had been reading, you do this very early in the morning because the queen is near the top. That has been known to be successful. Um, but some of the other, you know, uh, things you may read about, anything, any of these problems, what I would suggest that you do is contact your county extension office or, you know, get online. The University of Florida has so many publications. You can put fire ants, UF, the University of Florida and Google and find out everything they have about it. And then you are getting information that is scientific and research-based from your land-grant university. That's the place to go. The place not to go is your neighborhood Facebook group. Now, Master Gardener Facebook groups, sure. <laughs> you know, County Extension Facebook groups, sure. But just your general, um, you know, if you live in Deltona or something, you know, Deltona neighborhoods group, that's great to find out who likes this doctor, um, you know, what's going on. Was there a crash over, you know, uh, on these two streets? Um, are we having a Halloween parade? <laughs> you know, those kind of things. But to start asking lawn and landscape questions, um, you'll it'll be picking a needle out of a haystack to find good appropriate answers in those forums. So you've come to the right place and you've started in the right direction. <coughs> Some of the other lawn problems you could have are drought. People put too much stock in drought <laughs> and they try too hard to overcome drought. Cold damage. Um, and let me tell you the difference between cold damage and just um, a winter lawn. It is winter, it is December. It is, we have warm season grasses here in Florida. Up north, you may, you're used to the grass being green under the snow and you don't understand why our grass turns hay colored. Well, first of all, we're changing that vernacular. Our grass is golden in the winter. So let's you know put a more positive spin on it. And it is because it is a warm season grass. Therefore, it is going to go into a semi-dormant stage in the winter months, even if it's not that cold. So why or how does that happen? When I go home from work tonight, is it going to be light? Not for very long, no. So daylight hours. Daylight hours tell these lawns, go into your semi-dormant state and rest. It's okay, especially the further north you are in Florida, to have a golden lawn. Nothing's wrong with the lawn. Now, can they be susceptible to cold damage? Years ago, I used to work at County Extension and we would have um, St. Augustine lawns freeze. But that was if it was 15 degrees for several hours, that hasn't happened in a real long time. It has to be like below 20 for four hours or more to cause killing damage to your St. Augustine lawn. Your Bahia lawn will just pop right back, it won't care. Um, so if you think your lawn is cold damaged, unless we had a major, major, major cold front come through where they were doing rolling brownouts, you know, with the electricity and, you know, all of this, I wouldn't worry that it was um, affected by the cold perfectly fine to be this straw or golden colored. 
Now flooding that might occur. Um, we have, you know, had a lot of rain this winter, Citrus County, especially the Crystal River area seemed to get the most amount of rain. And there were some areas and yards that were um, covered in water for an extreme amount of time. That, yeah, a, a waterlogged um, lawn can, it can possibly kill your lawn out too, depending on how long that happens. Drought, hmm. <laughs> we've had, um, well, last May, and we had zero rain whatsoever. And those of us with Bahia grass lawns, boy, they were crunchy. And we thought, that's it. We finally killed our Bahia grass lawns. Those of us who don't add supplemental irrigation. As soon as it started raining, they started coming back again. Your St. Augustine lawn does not need as much water as you think it does. Half an inch to three quarters of an inch per watering event is really all that it needs. Um, to stay viable through through the drought times. You will do more damage over watering than not watering. So let's talk about the cultural things <coughs> with lawns. Wrong plant, wrong place. I'm gonna to to say that a lot of times. It's the opposite of right plant, right place. Your lawns, any of your lawns in Florida need six to eight hours of sunlight a day all year long. If they say it's shade tolerant, Really, um, Dr. Lester says it just means it takes longer to die in the shade. Overwatering, over fertilized. Um, watering too much or fertilizing inappropriately will cause more damage to your lawn than just allowing it to survive on natural rainfall or not fertilizing it at all. That is one of the things in the uh, class we learned. If you look back on my classes, um, Secrets of Master Gardeners Revealed, one of the secrets is if you don't fertilize, your lawn won't die. If you fertilize incorrectly, your lawn could die. So that is a class all unto itself as well. Just remember the label, the label, label, label is the law. And in some counties, you may have ordinances of when you're allowed to fertilize and when you're not. You don't need to fertilize that golden lawn that you have out there in the winter. It's semi-dormant. It has sloughed off a good deal of its roots. It has no capacity to take up um, that fertilizer that you're going to try to put on it. You can't green it up this time of year that way. So all you're doing is putting all that nitrogen, and all the other things in the fertilizer, letting it um, go straight through the sand and into our aquifer. So now is, not, now is not the time of year to fertilize. The University of Florida will tell you March 15th, you can start your spring fertilization. A lot of counties, Fernando County, you're, you're not allowed to fertilize between January 1st and March 31st. That two weeks won't hurt you. Citrus County, you can't fertilize until May 1st. That month won't hurt you. Um, just follow the label. Get a soil test from your county extension office first. You don't need to fertilize just because there's a certain date on the calendar and you think, oh, I should fertilize. Find out what your lawn needs first. Now, I have this in capital letters, and I know it's rude to write in capital letters. You don't like to get texts or uh, Facebook comments or anything in capital letters, but I can't stress this enough. Probably a good amount of our lawn problems are due to them being mowed too low. What is the appropriate height for St. Augustine lawn? Three to four inches. For a bahia grass, also three and a half to four inches. Some of your zoysia grasses, you can mow low, like one and a half to two. But in Hernando County, 99.9% .9 of our lawns are Floritan or bahia, have to be mowed at three and a half to four inches. That's the, that's the starting point. It really is, because if you mow it lower, you have created an unhealthy, stressed lawn that is subject 
to many of these other issues. So let's cover, before we move on from lawns, the top four problems with lawns. Have I mentioned mode too low? <laughs> Trying to get that through to you. And again, overwatered. We're gonna get into irrigation next, so we'll cover watering a little more. Over fertilized, over treated with pesticides. And what is this more on syndrome? This I stole from um, Jim Mall. He is currently the master gardener coordinator um, in Pasco County. He's held many hats over the years. Um, when he teaches some of these classes, he'll refer to well, let's talk about a lawn and you know it's looking bad to you so your first reaction is well um what about watering i need to put more on well that didn't work um it's still not doing well um i should go to fertilizer i need to put more on and well it must have some kind of insects or something let me put this insecticide all around let me put more on you can see where he goes with this um, analogy. The, uh, you know, this person is putting more on and more on and more on and <laughs> you know, not helping their lawn at all. So he helps this, hopes that this person who uh, puts more on will learn their less on <laughs> and learn to put less and less and less on. Less is better, less is more. Okay, irrigation problems. For those who have an irrigation system, there's a lot of clock confusion out there. A lot of people who don't understand how to use that clock that's in their um, garage. Get to know your clock if you're gonna use an irrigation system. You can go to YouTube. Um, you can put in your make and model and you will, because I know you've lost the manual, we all have. But you can put in your make and model and um, find, find the directions on the internet, a PDF of the directions. And I promise you, just go to YouTube and put in your make and model. There will be somebody showing you how to use that um, irrigation clock correctly. One thing you wanna do is make sure that um, when the time changes, you change that clock as well. You want to make sure, um, well, if I were to give you advice on it, you know what I would tell you to do? I'd tell you to turn it off. <laughs> That's what I would say to do and only put it on when you absolutely need it. Um, another problem with irrigations is ignorance of our um, watering ordinance. So if you live here in Hernando County, over to the left here, this is our uh, watering ordinance. It applies to everyone. The only question you need to ask yourself is, do I live in Hernando County? And you know, do I have an irrigation system that I water my lawn with? If that is so, then yes, this applies to you, even if you have a private well. And, and you wanna know why, you know, a lot of people get very disturbed with that. Why? It's my water. And I do have another class, really short one on uh, my well, our water. We're all getting our water from the same place, from the Florida aquifer under our feet. That's where all of our water comes from. That's where we as a muni mun municipality for Hernando County draws water with our big straws. And then each of us with private wells, we have little straws or that we're drawing water, all from the same place. So therefore, setting up these um, watering days helps with the stress on the aquifer. If there was no, you know, no way of spacing it out, what if everybody at once decided to try and pull water at the same time? So that's kind of the meaning behind that. <coughs> Why everyone is on this, it's not gonna change. It's not because of yeah, drought conditions. This is, this is the way that it is. And you should water, you are allowed to water, I should say, before eight or after 6 p.m. This says and, it should be or. 
Um, and her uh, Florida friendly landscaping would suggest this before eight. As close to dawn as possible will be better for the health of your lawn so that all that water is not sitting there overnight feeding that take all root rot or other issues. And you can see um, my address ends in a one. My day would be Monday if I watered. I broke my irrigation system putting in a pool. Haven't bothered <laughs> to ever fix it. Um, other irrigation problems, applying too much water. Let your lawn tell you when to water. I already mentioned you, how much does your lawn need? Half an inch to three quarters of an inch. And I kind of skated over that and you're probably still stuck at, how the heck do I know? <laughs> Why don't you tell me a time frame? Because I can't, um, because it's so many variables on that. Um, including how big your yard is, um, what kind of water pressure you have, what kind of heads you have. So that's why we suggest this catch can test. Very easy thing to do. Get you some tuna cans, cat food cans, flatware, anything, you know, straight sided cans. Measure three quarters of an inch in there, mark it with a Sharpie. Get several of those, place them randomly around a zone. Put that zone on, see how long it takes each of those cans to fill up to your marker, turn it off, write that down. That was zone one and that took 20 minutes. Kind of a, you know, it's not rocket science, but it will probably make a difference in your water bill if you have been overwatering. So, you know, worth a try. Again, it's December. That golden lawn out there doesn't need as much water as it does um, when it's actively growing. So you can easily skip a week in, uh, and go 14 days in between waterings. And here's something, um, I heard somebody say this in one of the classes that Dr. Lester gave, and I just, it really stuck in my mind because I just want everyone to remember because I think we went the wrong way. Your irrigation system supplements natural rainfall. You may say, well, that's kind of a given, but I bet you a lot of people have that backwards. They think that your irrigation system is the only thing keeping that lawn alive. It is the life support for your lawn. No, <laughs> rain, nature should be what's keeping your lawn alive. And then this irrigation should supplement that if there has not been enough rain. A lot of people tend to forget that. And I think it's because human nature, we wanna be in control. But what we do is we love our lawns too much and we're the ones causing the problems with the lawns. Your landscape plants don't need near as much water as your lawn does. So you don't want them on the same systems as your lawns. Um, either if you have established shrubs that are over two years old, the trees, take them off any irrigation system. Or at the very least, you can, it's very easy to retrofit a micro irrigation system onto your existing system in your beds. <laughs> that'll be better for them and it will save you water and money in the long run. Other problems are mixed heads in an irrigation zone, means it was installed improperly to begin with. If you have an irrigation zone, they should have all the same kind of heads, meaning if they you know, shoot out like this one, all of them should do that. If they um, are the ones that kind of you know, go all of them should do that. If they just pop up and come up like an umbrella, all of them should do that. Um, if you're at a point where you need to replace your irrigation system, um, you know, have someone come out and make sure they do it properly. Also misaligned heads, it's very easy for those heads to get turned around for whatever reasons, um, just being out in the elements and they may not be watering where they originally were watering. Maybe they're watering your house 
Maybe they're watering your driveway or the street or a, a palm tree that grew where it used to go over and around it. Now it just hits up against the palm tree. They're pretty easy to turn in the direction you need it to go. We have a lot of sand here. Um, heads get clogged with sand. Check for that. Check to see if they're popping up at all or if there's a problem with them popping up. Sometimes the grass grows over them. They sell those little cement round things. You can put to identify them. They call them donuts and you know, keep any uh, vegetation or whatever clear out of there. That will help. Leaks. I work for the water department. Let me tell you, I've seen some hideous bills <laughs> that have been associated with leaks. If you think you have a leak, it might be an underground leak. If an area is kind of stays wet and squishy all the time, or you know, um, doing all these things, you can put your irrigation system on to uh, evaluate it and check it. Because usually it's on when you're asleep. If you see one where you just there's not a head at all, it's just Old Faithful going on there, and which you didn't know because you were asleep. Leaks. Um, I promise you it is much cheaper to get an irrigation contractor out there to fix that than to continue to have a leak and have a water bill that um, then may lead to a hospital bill for you. So, you know, just keep on top of those things. Now, I want to cover shortly because I, I get a lot of phone calls about this, about new sod. Um, if you get brand new sod put down, you do have a 60 day variance here in Hernando County. I can't speak for anywhere else um, on the watering restrictions, but you have to follow these specific rules here and you can email me and I'll be glad to email it to you. Um, but this not only is the law of the ordinance of what you're allowed to water, this is the best way to establish a new lawn. Too many times I have heard, well, usually they call after their water, I mean, you know, when they pick themselves up off the floor after they got this horrendous water bill and they say, well, my lawn guy, no, my sod guy said, just water each zone an hour each day. I mean, like, you can just like pour money and, you know, in the toilet if you want to do that. Um, it's also, there's no, you know, that new saw doesn't have roots. So all you're doing is wasting water, sending it down the street into the nearest waterway or, you know, right through the aquifer. Frequent light watering is what um, sod being established needs. Now, I talked about leaks and I talked about new sod. And if you are a Hernando County Utilities customer and either of those things you know, happen in your life, you can call customer service and talk to them about um, an adjustment to your bill, One, once a year adjustment. So, if you say, I have new sod, can I get an adjustment? And they'll tell you, you know, you got to let it run for a certain amount of time. You have to use over a certain amount. And then they will average up, you know, what you normally spend. And they do all kinds of things. I don't know what they do, but then they'll get back with you about your adjustment. If you did that for sod, and then in three months, you have a major leak, maybe even a toilet leak or something, they will say, well, I'm sorry, you had your one for the year. So what I would do is if I was getting new sod and if I were a customer, I would budget in the cost of watering it in with the sod. And I would save my um, adjustment in the case I had a leak, but that is entirely up to you. You know, you, you have this right to use it. I do know if you follow these directions, um, because I um, actually monitored, monitored someone who I'm sure did this and his bill went up 40 or so dollars, maybe a little more um, per month, not hundreds. <laughs> so, you know, 
it makes a big difference. And this is better for the health of your lawn. Now let's move on to palms. Let's go to something completely different, palm problems. And I know the extension office, get to their Facebook page, their director, Jim Davis, he loves palms. He's the palm guy. He's the go-to guy when it comes to palms. So I'm sure he has classes um, that he's recorded on palms. But there are many diseases <laughs> that a um, palm tree can have, but I'm gonna cover one. Um, any of the diseases do need a laboratory diagnosis if you're gonna find out what they are. And you can take samples to the county extension office who will help you send it to a lab at the University of Florida. What they are looking for is um, biotic diseases um, of the plant. They cannot diagnose um, if anyone has poisoned your tree or thrown chemicals on it or anything like that. That you'll have to um, venture on your own to a private lab to try and find anything like that. But Again, just like the lawn, you take them a dead frond, <laughs> you know, again, it, it, they, they don't do autopsy, <laughs> let's just say it's dead. There has to be part of the pathogen still existing in the plant for them to ID it. Um, the one I'm gonna talk about because it is um, a problem and it's a sad problem for me because it's attacking our state palm tree attacking the sable palm, the cabbage palms, that's the same, um, same plant. Um, and it's called lethal bronzing. It used to be called Texas Phoenix palm decline. Now all of these palms are in the Phoenix palm family. That's where that word comes from. And I guess it was first um, found in Texas. But Texas objected to that name of <laughs> being part of a disease name for whatever reason. So they changed the name to lethal bronzing. And unfortunately, if your uh, um, cabbage palm has this, there's just no saving, no saving it. It's caused by a photo, photoplasma, which is an unculturable, uncultural, they can't culture it, bacterium that has no cell wall. And it lives in the phloem tissue. What's that mean? The sap, you know, that carries the nutrients back and forth. Now, palm trees are not trees. They are in the grass family. So like a tree, we're used to a tree with the rings that we know the sap goes up and down. Palm trees um, have more like little, little spots all over like a pepperoni pizza, like a pepperonis where the xylem and phloem um, move around. So it lives in that phloem tissue, it lives in, in the nutrient moving parts of the tree. And how does it get there? It gets there by different bugs, plant hoppers and leaf hoppers. They'll land on the tree. They have carried that uh, photoplasma with them. They, you know, inadvertently, inject or in fact I should say the tree with it and there there's just we haven't found a cure for it now <clears throat> the only cure is to remove all the infected trees now if there are healthy trees nearby um, it is possible to treat them with an antibiotic um, but you're going to have to keep doing that um, you know, who's going to do that? Probably resorts, you know, things like that. But this is, I kind of, I spent some time stumbling upon, you know, this, I found the, the treatment, you know, in a University of Florida publication, but I contacted um, another uh, doctor of plant medicine <laughs> that I know, not Dr. Lester, a different one, because I had in my mind something he said, you know, like 15 or so years ago. He is still not in favor of using antibiotics on plants. So I was asking him, are you just not in favor of using it on edible crops? And he said, no, not on any, because just using it 
putting it out there um, could in, in the long run limit the amount of antibiotic, you know, resistance develops just in, you know, in general. So there may be less antibiotics available for human or mammals, mammals in general to use. That's one opinion. Another opinion is, you know, this is the treatment for these palms. And some people say it's not the same kind of antibiotics that humans use. So just giving you both sides of the coin there. Would I, um, if my cabbage palms were dying, you know, um, and I had healthy ones left, would I take the effort to inject them with antibiotics? Probably not, you know, as much as I hate to lose these native plants. I would hope there would, you know, be some other way. That's not the only thing. <coughs> Palm uh, nutrient deficiencies look very much like diseases. Palms are so confusing to me. I mean, I would definitely take it to the county extension office for diagnosis because this the yellowing on the margins here means something different than if it were yellowing from the stem and it's a different type of deficiency. Um, and it's, sometimes it's hard to tell it apart from diseases. A lot of people say, well, you know, grandma always threw Epsom salt out there and her palms did great. Not really a problem with that. She's giving it magnesium, but don't rely on that as the full treatment of your palm. Your palm needs lots of stuff other than just the magnesium. What it doesn't need is a lot of nitrogen. What are you putting on your lawn where your palm is standing? Lots of nitrogen. So a lot of times we find out that palms that are exhibiting problems in the middle of a lawn, their problem is they have had too much nitrogen. So, you know, I guess the answer would be to not fertilize within a certain amount of feet your lawn fertilizer around that palm. And so applying the wrong fertilizer again will cause more problems than if you just didn't fertilize it at all. And this I had to take because it gets so very confusing because where I would want to simplify it and say, just get something that says palm special. Um, there's even a publication out there from the University of Florida saying, oh, well, you know, not, not necessarily. So I had to take wording from this uh, publication um, which is called Not All Landscape Palm Fertilizers Are Created Equal. And it says the only way to ensure that you will be getting an effective fertilizer is to specify that 100% of the nitrogen, potassium, magnesium, and boron sources are slow release and that manganese and iron and other micronutrients are present in sulfate or chelated form. Chelated, sorry, form. So yeah, that's confusing to me too. So that is where you wanna ask me for a PDF of this <laughs> so you have that in writing, or you can Google that not all landscape palm fertilizers are created equal. If you're on, you know, on the search for a palm fertilizer, I would suggest you go to some kind of specialty store. Um, you know, there used to be like a John Deere store. I'm not sure if there still is around here. I don't know if you're gonna find the appropriate palm fertilizer in your regular everyday garden center, but you can look at the labels and, you know, find out if it follows those directions. Now you're probably more confused than you were before, but it is a confusing topic. Another problem with palms is perhaps they were planted too deeply. Um, and that's a problem with any plant out there, except possibly tomatoes. Um, that if you plant it too deeply, well, Jim Mall, who I mentioned before, his saying is plant them high and they won't die plant them low and they won't grow. Palms are especially um, susceptible to that. 
there's a story where the Pasco County director went out to a community that um, had planted um, you know, their, their roadway into their community. They wanted it to be like an avenue of the palms, you know, beautiful looking um, driveway. And about every third or fourth one was just dying. And she asked, well, how, this is amazing. How did you get all these palms the same size? And they said, well, no, they weren't. We, we wanted that look, so we planted some of them deeper. Guess which ones were dying? <laughs> um, something to keep in mind there. And also pruning them. You will, when hurricane season starts back up again, you'll have someone knock at your door, offer to hurricane prune your palms. Let, I'm, I'm here to tell you that's not a thing. Palms have been around way before we were. They pretty much can withstand hurricanes, you know, if all other conditions with them are okay. You've seen them on the news. Aren't they always kind of folded like this when they're blowing in the wind, they fold over? What they're doing is here is its growing point right in here. That's the only thing keeping this alive or dead right in there. So here they have taken away any of the fronds that would bend together and protect that growing point. So, you know, this is inappropriate. Here, let's just say before pruning, you had all this, um, nothing terrible will happen if you don't prune it. But if you do wanna prune it, imagine this is three o'clock and nine o'clock. Don't prune anything above three o'clock and nine o'clock. And then you, you will have a much healthier palm. This, you're exposing that growing point and um, making a weak palm. And, you know, how are these attractive? <laughs> you know, let's move on to bedding plants, our plants um, in our landscape beds. There's lots of problems that could go wrong with them. Could be various leaf spots. Um, here's what we're showing here. This leaf spot is on roses. Let me tell you, if you have roses, they're gonna find every problem that a rose can possibly have, and they're gonna get it <laughs> here in Florida. <clears throat> roses, I always say, other than you know the more um, old fashioned, what they call cracker roses, you know, climbing roses. I have some of those that I ignore completely. Sometimes I cut down to the ground, they grow, they come back, they do fine. But if you're trying to do hybrid teas, things like that, I'm not saying it can't be done, but usually it can be done on a fairly temporary basis and it better be something you love to do and that you wanna spend a whole lot of time um, putting fungicides down and caring for. I mean, like almost daily or weekly putting the fungicides down in the summer and caring for them daily. You can't have low maintenance roses here in Florida. So it's gonna get this black spot. It's going to get lots of things. Our other plants, spider mites, looks like this webbing on there, aphids and mealybugs. I don't have a picture of nematodes, root knot nematodes. A lot of these can be solved by number one, right plant, right place. Um, another one is that they're not overwatered. Another one is that you don't put down an insecticide to kill everything in your lawn because there are lots of beneficial insects out there that are your allies that'll help you in the battle against these guys. And they're your friends and you want, um, you want to provide a good meal for them. So you have to have some of these pest insects to be their meals. Um, or a lot of times when, when I see spider mites or something, scout off and go out in your yard, scout off. And if I see a problem, I'm too lazy to go to the store and figure out what insecticide and all that. I have a pair of little pruners, prune it off put it in a plastic bag, throw it away with my household trash. Usually that solves the problem right there. So 
those are the things that could happen, but sometimes we overreact to them. Um, I didn't find a picture of a bad plant bed. So you, <laughs> you have to look at the pretty plant bed here, but here, Again, like I said, wrong plant, right, wrong place. If it's a sun loving plant and it's not in the sun, it probably won't do very well. If it's a shade loving plant like in Patience and it's out in the middle of the sun, it's not going to do very well. If um, it's pH finicky and you have too high of a pH, it's not gonna do very well. If it's not a plant that normally grows in your zone, our zone is 9A, it's not going to do very well. Also, these bedding plants, if they're planted too deeply, they also won't thrive. And the same thing, overwatered and um, overtreated, meaning if you see some bugs or you see some problems and you just drag out the seven and you <laughs> sprinkle it around everywhere, I would think the purpose of having these bedding plants for me would be also to attract a lot of uh, wildlife butterflies, dragonflies, um, hummingbirds, all of that. You can't have those things and an insecticide filled landscape bed. Let nature take care of nature. Let's move on to trees. Trees can have a myriad of problems. They can have different viruses, funguses, bacteria, <coughs> maybe an insect problem. Some of them can have saltwater damage if you happen to live on the coast. They may have had incidents with weed eaters or lawn mowers. Sometimes maybe chemical exposure um, if you painted your house or pressure washed your house. You know, they got some chemicals on them. Trees, the thing about trees is they won't tell you they're sick, they won't act sick pretty much until it's too late. <laughs> so there's not a whole lot that can be done to save them, unfortunately. Um, if it starts looking bad, you can always take, you know, a good branch or so to county extension, see if there is something that can be done. Um, generally, trees left alone do a lot better than the ones we try to over treat. Again, wrong plant, wrong place. Maybe that tree is not meant to grow out in the sun or it's, you know, not put in the correct place or it grows too big for where you put it. Again, planting too deeply is extremely important with trees. Um, pruning incorrectly, that causes a lot of issues with tree health. Again, incorrect expectations. What does that mean? Probably that, it, I mean, that it's growing too big. We see that a lot with crate myrtles, and then we over prune them and shorten their lives. Then again, there's always natural aging. Maybe you bought your property because of this absolutely gorgeous ancient oak tree on it. And we have in our minds, you know, a tree that was around when our grandmother was should be around after we're long gone. <laughs> and the truth of it is, especially urban trees have a lot shorter lifespan than a tree in the forest. And it's a living thing. And it has a, a lifespan just like you and I, and it un, it's undergoing a lot of stresses in an urban situation. Sometimes the tree has just lived its life, which might be sad for us to think of. Shrub problems are gonna have the same kind of problems basically as trees. They also are subject to spider mites as well as aphids, mealybugs. Um, saltwater damage again could occur if you're on the coast. This sooty mold, that is, um, this is the result of various things happening. It's the result of aphids on the undersides of the leaves. And then they excrete something called honeydew. Doesn't that sound nice? <coughs> this sooty mold grows on top of the honeydew. Not it's mostly cosmetic. It's usually not that too terrible of a problem. So it's usually just a cosmetic issue. So I wouldn't worry too terribly about that. These spots could be any number of things, even water spots. 
from how it's irrigated or even rain bouncing up off the ground. There just is a number of various things, but it does have this yellow halo and it is um, not perfectly round. Usually perfectly round is gonna be a fungus of some kind. These splotches could be bacteria, could be any number of things. I would take it to the county extension office or I'd prune that part off and never think about it again. We can plant our shrubs too deeply. We can actually over mulch them and this goes for trees too. You've seen a lot of people, what we call volcano mulch around the trees. That's the exact same thing as planting them too deeply. They're buried under there. They could, um, they could attract insects that way, pest insects. They could hold too much moisture and cause fungal problems. Trees not getting oxygen, nor the shrub. Both of them will have, especially trees will have a flare at the bottom. That flare should be exposed. So two to three inches of mulch. Otherwise you're over mulching. Maybe you planted them too close together, not taking into account how much they're gonna grow as they get older. Again, shrubs are probably more susceptible to equipment incidents, weed eaters, lawnmowers, you know, that can adversely affect them. A, a little, especially on a tree, a um, little wound on a little tree can become a big wound on a big tree. And again, especially shrubs right next to the house, if it got paint or bleach somehow, it can suffer. This particular plant, according to the uh, UF <laughs> publication it came from, because it could be any of those things. And the publication said this is an azalea. I'm trying to exactly see how um, I even sent it to a colleague who said, well, maybe if it's further north, could be a rhododendron. <laughs> so it could be in the azalea family, um, regardless of what it is. It's not happy. And this symptom is due to overwatering. It was a water log, it's roots. And that is what the person I sent it to said, whatever it is, it's, a, it's symptomatic of root rot damage. But we'll look at that and we think it needs water and it would be just the opposite. So it, I guess the moral is it's hard to tell why the plant looks sick. And we have to do a lot of research to find out what exactly is happening around it. Let me talk quickly about soil. Soil is, you know, our foundation. <coughs> so maybe there could be problems with soil. If azaleas and exora, things like that, they want a lower pH. If we put them in a higher pH soil, they're not gonna be happy. Soil compaction, that is a major problem of your trees that I talked about before. Some people say this tree suddenly fell down dead. Well, and, and then in talking to them, you find out three years ago, they put in a pool or their neighbors did or something, or a house was built next door or something. And all that equipment and the soil compact, compaction eventually catches up to being a problem um, for the trees. Fill dirt in new homes, where they get that fill dirt from is not up here where our version of topsoil is, but they usually like if they um, clear out for a DRA or something, they get that very bottom soil and they sell that for our fill dirt. That's why it's all kind of orangey. And then we try to throw a lawn and shrubs and things on top of it and it really, <laughs> no nutrients whatsoever. So that may, you know, don't feel too bad if you're not having a lot of success because you're not having much to build on there. But remember, sand is soil. A lot of people say nothing grows in Florida, it's too sandy. If you're one of those people, and I know we're moving along now, but I want to, so I'm gonna give you a break. If you're one of those people who say nothing grows in Florida, Take a break for a minute and get up and go outside and look um, out the window. Don't go outside, but just look out your window. Then come back, we'll get back to you. <laughs> um, what helps, especially with uh, the fill dirts, 
is um, you can buy compost amendments. There's a product out there called Command with one M that a lot of people are adding before they put their soil down. This has actually been an experiment in Marion County in on top of the world. It's working out great. Um, some people in our own community and some of the gated communities have been trying it too. That same gentleman whose water I was watching when he put down new sod, he actually put down this command product as well. And it really helps that soil to become established. Um, or you can top dress it like a fertilizer, but it doesn't count under our fertilizer ordinance um, to, to help your lawn. So you can use um, a mushroom compost, even you know a cow manure compost or something to help build up that soil. Now, those of you who went to look out the window, you nothing grows in Florida, people. You should be back by now. What did you see outside your window? Barren desert? Oh, you saw trees and you saw weeds and you saw some kind of plants. Things grow in Florida. You just gotta know the right things to grow in Florida. Very quickly, because this is a subject all into itself. And I, why do I have here the problem with seductive invasive plants? Because there's so many invasive plants that we'll fight for and we'll say, no, I am not getting rid of my, you know, Mexican petunias. They don't get away from me. So all I'm going to say right here, because this is a class unto itself, but when naturalized non-native plants spread extensively into natural areas and they will get away from you. You don't control birds or the wind. Displacing native plants and disrupting natural processes, they are called invasive. Invasive non-native plants can be thought of as weeds in natural areas. I don't think weed is a bad word, but in this case, invasive weed is a bad word. And you can find more information about that um, from invasive plants, um, solutions for your life. You can look that up. This particular one right here is called coral ardesia, very uh, common in our woodlands, burying right now. It had, it's hard to see, but it has these beautiful scalloped edges. That's not a plant that you wanna have around, no matter how pretty it is. Lastly, I wanna to touch on problems that aren't problems for anyone um, who may be new here or may not know this. Lichen, the extension office has people bring in um, crepe myrtle, uh, other shrubs that have this on it. They think there's an algae and a problem, you know, killing their shrub. Now it may have this on it <coughs> and maybe your shrub or tree is dying, but this is not killing it. Um, lichen is a very healthy part of our ecosystem. I think right now, um, a friend of mine is teaching a class about lichen at the Chinsigit Conservation Center. Um, she did a lot of studying on it. So I may bring her to one of our online classes as well so she can teach us about it. It's a combination of an algae and a fungus and a yeast all working um, in a symbiotic relationship. Doesn't, it's not a parasite, does not take away from your plant at all. In fact, especially the pink lichen is an indicator of good air quality. It won't grow where there is a lot of pollution. So that's a good thing. Up here we have ball moss. Yes, it puts little tentacles on your tree. It's just supporting itself. It's not boring into your tree. It is an air plant. It's in the bromeliad pineapple family. It is not taking anything out of your tree. It, it lives off of the air. It's an epiphyte, just like Spanish moss is an epiphyte. Spanish moss is not killing your tree. Sometimes it gets framed for a job it didn't do. The tree is in decline anyway. Maybe it's that natural aging or whatever. Maybe it, the soil is compacted, whatever. As it's declining, the Spanish moss will take advantage of more sun and grow more. And maybe sometimes it'll shade out some stuff so you can, you know, knock it down if you want to, but it is not a parasite. It's 
these things have all been here millions of years. You know, they're not killing our trees. They're a part of living in Florida. A neat thing I learned fairly recently, zebra long wings sleep inside Spanish moss. So that's pretty cool too. Here are some of the resources that I pulled from. Um, again, if you'd like a copy of this, email me and I'll be glad to send um, these links and these resources to you. We have classes coming up, um, all kinds of classes. So next week on the 8th, last week I said this class was gonna be on the 15th, that has changed. <laughs> it's gonna be on the 8th, um, the shady side of your landscape. When I talked about wrong, plant, wrong place, maybe it needs to be in the sun and it's too shady. Let's talk about what will grow in the shade. Um, then the 29th, December 29th, budget conscious yard care, be the end of the year, we'll be past Christmas. We'll need to find out what we can do now that all our money is gone. <laughs> um, as a follow-up to this class, I told Dr. Lester they're gonna wanna know about vegetables and other home edibles. So we are gonna re pre-record a class, should be available around January 14th on YouTube and on Facebook. Um, what could go wrong with home edible crops? So look for that one. Then he's gonna have two classes um, that I'll host him at that'll get really, really, really into specifics, diagnostic specifics. So January 19th and February 2nd, diagnosing plant problems in your home landscape with Dr. Bill Lester, parts one and two. So that should be a lot of fun too. Again, here is my email, because I know I threw a lot of information at you. So if you want this back in writing, or again, watch it again, um, fast forward through the boring parts, whatever, listen to what you want to listen to, um, either on Facebook or on YouTube. And my email is lilyb at hernandocounty.us. Thank you, everybody, um, for joining us today. And we'll see you again next week for the shady side of your landscape. Thank you and have a great day.